What's up, audit fans? Dr. Amanda White here, and today we're going to fill a gap in my standards explain videos that uh, is definitely needed, and a fair few people have said, Amanda, why is there no video on 620? So today we're going to dig into 620. Let's jump in. What's up audit fans, Dr. Amanda White here. For those people who are new to my channel, hi and welcome, my name is Amanda. I do love to audit and I teach audit to undergrads at a major Australian university. Now, for those people who are regulars, hello and thank you so much uh, for subscribing and still watching. Where have I been? Um, I We had vacation time, then I became uh, a bit unwell with just the flu, nothing to worry about. And then Delta, um, we have a, a Delta outbreak of the uh, COVID-19 Delta outbreak here in Sydney. It's locked down probably, you know, almost half of the population here in Australia. And I don't know about anybody else, but it's it's been pretty tough and we've been watching it uh, all around the world as well. So my heart goes out to everybody out there right now. It is tough and uh, I'll keep chipping away at little bits that I can in terms of uh, supporting you in your teaching and learning. It's been real struggle um, for me. I have a four-year-old and an eight-year-old at home. So daycare, my youngest one, uh, was recommended not to go to daycare, only for the kids of essential workers. My eight-year-old, it is school term, so there's no, uh, there's no summer vacation here because it's our winter. So I have been teaching preschool for my four-year-old so he can get ready to go to kindergarten next year. I've been teaching, home, doing homeschool, uh, remote learning for my eight-year-old and uh, working as well. So it's been pretty full on. We're sort of getting into a rhythm of lockdown and I have a new desk set up and I thought, okay, I'm going to use this to make a video. So I mentioned I'm plugging a gap in terms of my standards explain videos. And I do know that some of those have had some uh, changes in standards. So there'll be some updates coming out as well. I'm not making videos on any specific timetable, just when I can. We can, we can have stories. No, I said you could watch Bluey or we could have a story, but now it's bedtime. <laughs> so really the only time I have to make uh, videos is at night. Typically when I'm exhausted and uh, it's the end of a long day. So hopefully I'm getting into a bit of a rhythm and I'm going to try, <laughs> fingers crossed, to make videos a little bit more regularly. So let's dive into the standard and start working through 620. Now, uh, if you're use an international standard user, you can also look at ISA 620. They are relatively new. And as you can see here in uh, this particular one, um, this is a new compilation for the Australian standards uh, from the 8th of July. So there's been some new amendments coming into place in that compilation. So as always, we go into our table of contents. Remember that all of our auditing standards are structured exactly the same. So you have your application that really tells us about what this applies to. You'll notice that these are AUS paragraphs only for the AUS jurisdiction. When you're looking at the international standards, you'll start with the introduction. So we have the scope, the responsibility, uh, the date of when it starts, because there may be some uh, transition between standards, and then objectives, what is the standard all about? So it's one or two sentences. Key terms being defined, and this is a relatively new uh, thing in standards, but it's good to have. And then the requirements. Remember the requirements are the legally enforceable components here in Australia. And then when we get down to the application and other material, this is simply guidance uh, to help us interpret the requirements of the standards. So the requirements are the legal component and the guidance or the explanatory material is the guidance for implementation. Now, of course, if you've checked out the new AUASB portal, um, there is fantastic cross-referencing between standards and explanatory material. Check out my other video where I walk through the website. Um, you know, 
It'd be great if we could see that at the international accounting standards level as well and the international auditing standards, but it's a really great resource, especially if you have an open book exam. And then there's, again, a, a statement on, well, this conforms with the international standards. So let's dig in to the authority statement, the auditing standards. Okay, so why do we have this standard? We have this standard because we cannot know everything. We know about auditing, we know about accounting, but sometimes we may need to rely on someone who understands chemistry, science, engineering, um, complex valuation, complex financial tools more than we do. Now, obviously, most auditors are industry specialists. We specialize in a specific industry. Mine was financial services. But sometimes we need advice outside of that realm. So we may need to have the work of an individual or, or organization in a field of expertise other than accounting or auditing. So I need somebody to perhaps help me gather evidence, to evaluate evidence, to see whether it's sufficient and appropriate. I'm just gonna dig into one of the things for the explanatory material. Who actually qualifies as an expert? And A1 in the explanatory material has some really great uh, examples. Valuation of complex financial instruments. So the key here is that word valuation. So even though valuation, I guess, is an accounting thing, complex is the other term, valuations will need to be done by experts. That could be, and a key one here, intangible assets, um, business combinations, jewelry, though you're probably not going to audit any clients that have jewelry in <laughs> as their assets, um, but land and buildings, especially if it's complicated overseas, um, you can use an expert. Actuarial calculations for insurance. Again, you could have your own expert. Estimating oil and gas reserves for um, commodities companies. Valuation of environmental liability and site cleanup. Remember, those costs need to be included in the long-term cost of a project. Interpreting contracts, laws, and regulations, especially when it's overseas, um, or tax issues. Okay, so they say unusual tax or complex tax is where that falls outside the general knowledge of, of your general accountant. So um, there's some very clear information here about when the standard is not suitable. So where the engagement team includes a member or consults with an individual with expertise in a specialized area of auditing or accounting. And uh, if the work of that expert is used by the client to prepare the financial report. So the client may engage an expert. That's not what this covers. And we also should not be hiring the same expert because then they're not independent. So the auditor's responsibility component up here really just reminds us it is our responsibility. Even though we may use an expert, we rely on that expert, the responsibility solely rests with the audit partner. So. Uh, the auditor has sole responsibility and it has nothing to do with the expert. So what exactly are the objectives of the standard? There are two things. Number one, should I use an auditor expert? All right, so should we need one? And then if I decide to use the work, how do I know that it's going to be suitable for my purposes? Because remember, under ASA 500, I have to collect evidence that is sufficient and appropriate. I also need to make sure that it's reliable and that it's relevant as well. So how do I know whether my expert is reliable, um, that they're able to meet all of the requirements? We've got lots of definitions here about who an expert is, um, and there's a, a clear definition of management's expert. So that's when the management have hired an expert, Quite often management will hire an expert and we will hire our own expert. So now let's dig into the requirements. Remember the requirements are the bits that are legally enforceable. So the first part is, do I need an expert? So in paragraph seven, it says there, if expertise in a field other than accounting or auditing is necessary, we shall determine whether to use the work of an expert. All right, and you can go into more into A4 to A9 there. So something outside of accounting, 
It could be engineering, it could be IT, it could be science, something else um, that's not accounting or auditing. Then I need to think about in paragraph eight, the nature, timing and extent of audit procedures. Remember, I need to build up an audit program, a body of work that's going to help me gather my evidence, which I hope is going to be, remember, sufficient. Just making sure I don't write over my head here. And appropriate. All right, so I need my audit program to generate audit evidence. And so I need to figure out out of this evidence, what component do I need to get from my expert and what evidence can we get by the audit team? Because the audit team is going to be able to collect a lot, but I have to figure out early on what information is going to be needed by my expert. What sort of procedures will I need the expert to engage in, which is where it comes into nature, what audit procedures or what procedures might they need, timing, which is going to be the when question, and extent, which is how much. So we really need to start thinking about experts right at the planning stage of our audit, right? At the planning stage, figure out who your experts need to be so that you can book them in early. Practical measure, um, in some specific uh, scientific or other areas, there are only a certain number of really great experts and you wanna be able to book those experts in first. Um, if you're slow or if you don't realize you need an expert till later, you may not be able to get the expert that you need that has the right qualifications to be able to do the work that needs to be done or they go, oh man, you booked me, I'm really late. I've already got these other three audits that I'm being an expert for. I'm gonna charge you extra. So you certainly don't wanna be in that position because that's going to eat into the profit margin of the engagement. So figure out early at that planning stage what you're going to need. So I mentioned before, we need to figure out the nature of the audit work, what area of expertise is required, the risk of material misstatement. All right, is this a high risk or a low risk area? Remember, high risk is going to need more expertise and more evidence. Um, the significance of that expert's work in the context of the audit. How important is this work to generating um, our opinion? If it's really important, we're going to need to be really careful. Um, my, and this one's an interesting one, knowledge and experience of previous work performed by that expert. So this is sort of like, we want to get our references. So we want to do a reference check on this expert. I just don't want to search the internet for somebody that is apparently an expert. I'm going to want to check with previous auditors. Is this person a reliable expert? Do they have the expertise? Do they have the qualifications? And then whether that expert is subject to the quality control policies and procedures. And generally, if you do use an expert, their work needs to be reviewed. You need to understand it sufficiently. Okay, so let's get into how do I know whether this person is a good expert? To do that, we're going to look at the competence, capabilities, and objectivity of the expert. Now remember, these are things that the auditor also needs to have. So if you think back to the code of ethics, the code of ethics for accountants actually says you need to have professional competence. You need to be able to do the job and objectivity, which is also linked to independence. Okay, so competence, that's the right skills, qualifications. So I have to evaluate whether the expert has the necessary competence, capabilities, and objectivity. So are they independent from the client? Have they got the right skills, training, experience, members of appropriate professional bodies, recognition of an expert potentially. So I need to go away and I need to do all of those checks because I have to make sure that there's no threat to the expert's objectivity. 
just like we have threats to independence from um, the ethical standard 110, we also need to consider this for our experts. If an expert owns shares in our client, then they're not going to be able to be objective and independent. So we need to do those background checks on our experts really thoroughly. I also need to obtain an understanding of the field of expertise of the expert. So what exactly does that mean? So we need to think about what is the field of expertise? It's the field or the research area or the work area of that expert. What does it say we need? Sufficient understanding of the field to enable us to figure out what is the nature, scope and objectives of the work I need them to do and to evaluate the adequacy of that work. This one's probably the hardest one to figure out when it comes to field of expertise. I need to know enough if this was geology. I need to know enough about the field of geology to be able to make sure I give the auditor, oh, sorry, I give the expert the right instructions on what I want them to do. And then I'm going to need to evaluate the output. So I need to know enough to be able to read the report to be able to understand what the report means, to ask any questions of the expert. Oh, can you explain this? Oh, this doesn't sound right. Well, what's going to be the accounting implication? You can't hire an expert without first knowing what the report is going to look like um, and, and how to evaluate it. Because if you don't, then the expert could say anything and you'd be like, yep, got an expert, sign off. And that's going to put you in some real big trouble. So, We've covered so far that we have to consider when we need the expert, plan it out right at the beginning, find an expert with the right competence, capabilities, and is objective. We need to understand enough about the expert's work to be able to give them instructions and then evaluate their output. And then where it says here, uh, agreement with the auditor's expert, when they say agreement, they don't mean that we need to agree with what the expert finds, but we should have a contract. All right. So just like any business dealings, a contract between the auditor and the expert that says, here is the work you're going to do. Here is my responsibility as the auditor and your responsibility as the expert. What sort of communication and when the report needs to be done and confidentiality. Again, right back to um, the code of ethics, that we need to remain confidential. And remember, in the auditor's engagement letter, as part of 210, we also sign confidentiality for us and everybody on the team, and that needs to extend to the expert as well. Now, here comes the tricky bit. I'll highlight this one. Uh, let's go back to orange. Evaluate the adequacy of the expert's work. Remember back here, we dis, dis, we uh, it says that I need to know enough about the field to be able to evaluate the work. Uh, otherwise, they could just say anything and we'd go, oh, yeah, that looks good, which is definitely not what we want. So I need to evaluate the expert's work to find out, does it look relevant and reasonable? Um, and are their findings and conclusions consistent with other audit evidence? Does the financial evidence back up to the scientific evidence? Are they saying the same thing? Are they telling the same story? So I need to look at it and say, is this the right information I need? Does it look reliable? Does it seem reasonable? And remember, we're trying to put together this puzzle of all these evidence pieces to figure out, does this make sense or not? So we need to evaluate to see whether the expert's evidence fits into the puzzle that we have about the client. Now, if the expert's work uses assumptions and methods, which quite often it will, oh, we're assuming this rate of um, you know, dec decay in blah, 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 science thing, all right? So we need to, if, it, if they do use assumptions and methods, I need to look at those assumptions and methods and say, are they reasonable? So I need to do my own research I need to, this is why I need to have a knowledge of the field of expertise. So I have an understanding, but I'm not an expert as the auditor. Um, and if I'm using source data, then is that data relevant, complete, and accurate? So just like if we're evaluating accounting information, if that accounting information is not complete, then I'm going to have issues. If the, if the expert is using data, 
we need to make sure that that data comes from a great system that has strong internal controls, that there's low chances of manipulation so that whatever analysis we do on that data, it's rock solid in terms of the outcome. Now, what happens if I evaluate the work and oh, I'm unhappy because the work is not adequate? Well, <laughs> then something has gone wrong. So if it's not adequate, you've got two options. The first one is, all right, you've got to do more work. So you have to be really clear on what extra work needs to be done so that we can get back and assume that the, and say that the evidence is appropriate for what we need. Um, and we have to consider whether we need to do extra audit procedures. All right. Now, if the work is not adequate, it might also be a question of, did we go back up here and have in our agreement, was this really nice and clear about what was expected? Or did we choose the wrong expert? If we didn't choose a great expert, we're going to you know, ask them to do more, do more audit work, uh, as it mentions here in paragraph 13, but we might just have to think, I'm not gonna use that expert next time. Let's put that person on a list of people not to use because it just might not be worth it. Now, just because I used an expert, and, and when you think about you know academia and academic writing where I rely on the work of someone else, I should always acknowledge it, right? that's integrity. But when it comes to audits, where I've relied on an expert, I do not need to disclose that I, need, I use the expert in the opinion unless the law says so. So that comes up uh, right here. So the auditor shall not refer to the work of an auditor's expert in the report for an unmodified opinion unless required to do so by law. Um, I haven't ever come across an instance where that might be the case. Um, but uh, you might have one. If you have one, share one in the comments if you've ever seen one. Um, if I need to refer to an expert, let's say something has gone wrong. Uh, the client's expert says, this should be, you know, this number. Our expert says it should be this number. We have this disagreement. We cannot get to um, some sort of agreement. Then we're going to have a modified audit report. You may need to talk about, well, the expert says this and management says this, and we could not move from those places. So um, that, that's one place where you may reference the work of your expert. Now, so what are the key things I want you to take away from ASA 620? Number one, if you need an expert, you need to plan early, all right? Figure out who that expert is. Choose your expert wisely, all right? And planning early will allow you to choose that expert wisely. Once you've chosen that expert, you need to come to an agreement which is your contract on what needs to be done in relation to um, the expert's work. That agreement needs to have clear instructions. All right, remember that you also need to consider um, understanding methods, assumptions, and data so that you can then go and, all goes into here, evaluate the work of the expert. All right, and as long as we follow those major rules in regards to experts, then you've got on the right path to making sure that you use an expert where needed, when needed, and in a way that makes sure that you generate sufficient and appropriate evidence because all of this, remember, feeds in to our audit opinion. So after, I think it's been two years, I finally plugged the hole when it comes to 620. Um, if you have a standard that you think I should revise uh, that has been some changes or you think is priority, please let me know in the comments. Um, I hope everybody is trying to stay safe, stay well, 
Uh, I've had my two doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. I was jabbed with the Pfizer. And uh, those people who are in Australia will, if you haven't uh, seen Jimmy Reese on YouTube, check him out for his Meanwhile in Australia series. That's keeping me sane. Click play whenever one of those new videos comes out. But stay safe, stay well, and I look forward to seeing you all next time. And hopefully that's not a long time from now. I'm going to try to make sure it's not a long time from now. Bye. If you can, I'd love for you to subscribe, leave a comment, click like, and I'll chat to you all next time. Bye.